My next guest is Michael Beyer. He is was an award-winning National Board Certified K-12 teacher and principal. He transformed a school on the south side of Chicago, then led the merger of two schools, one being the wealthiest in Chicago and the other in the Cabrini Green housing development. Since leaving education, he has worked as a real estate broker, chief of staff of an environmental nonprofit, and currently a change management consultant. Mike served overseas in the U.S. Air Force and has received a bachelor's degree in psychology, two master's degrees in art history and education, and a doctorate in educational leadership. Mike is married to his wife of more than 20 years, with whom they have two children. He taught in middle school and was a self-contained teacher for eight years and then was an administrator uh, for PK through 12 for close to 10 years. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Thank you, Dana. Well, I'd like to start off with uh, the question I ask everybody. Tell me about a time when you were in the trenches and managed to crawl out. Uh, the trenches, what was that last part of the question? And managed to... Crawl out. Crawl out? What do you mean? Yes. So I know your your trench story, like how how did you work your way out of that into what you're oh, doing? Yeah, seriously, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so really I was, I was I was forced out, right? I'm not I'm not shy about it because uh, when I was when the district tried to fire me, um, you know, I was on the cover of every newspaper and it was covered by the radio, uh, even the television. Uh, so it was a pretty traumatic experience. And so I don't hide the fact that they tried to fire me, tried to push me out. Uh, so I didn't really have a choice in the matter. Uh, but I made the best of it. And I look back at it now, and it was actually the best um, uh, outcome by far. In fact, you know, I, I tell my kids all the time, I wish I'd started uh, what my current work uh, much earlier and had never gone into education. Although, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for all the time I spent in schools because I feel like I did uh, make a change. It did, you know, contribute. I didn't just, you know, uh, cash a paycheck. Um, but it's definitely a different uh, lifestyle now that I'm not in the trenches. Um, in fact, um, in my work now, whenever anybody complains about the work, I, I say, you know, maybe you should go substitute teach for a day. And you'll appreciate your job a, a heck of a lot more. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, people want to learn more about uh, your story. They could definitely buy your book, which is Pencils Down, Career Journeys of Educators Who Left the Profession and What We Can Learn from the Crises in Education. So talk a little bit about your writing process. And mm -hmm. uh, did you start writing the book right after you left education or kind of how did that begin? No, uh, wrote it about five years after I left. And um what happened was that after I left, uh, I was pretty burnt out and my career was in tatters. I spoke to a recruiter and I, and I was a principal of a, one of the largest schools in Chicago. We had, when we left three campuses, K through 12, I thought I was on the track to one day be a superintendent. So it was you know, significantly derailed my plans. Um, I even had my superintendent endorsement all ready to go. So I talked to a recruiter a headhunter. I said, well, how can I get back into schools? And, and they flat out said, mm -hmm. uh, you have to move out of state, right? My yeah. wife has a great job. She's not going to move. Her kids are settled in school. So I tried real estate for a couple of years and, you know, I'm the main breadwinner. I mean, my family relies on me for insurance. Um, so I went, I became chief of staff for Open Lands, an environmental group for a couple of years, and then I went into uh, change management consulting. Mm -hmm. And because I made several switches, you know, I reinvented myself several times, as someone suggested. You know, and and even when, like, you know, shortly after, in fact, I include this anecdote in the book. Even when I was in the midst of a legal battle, colleagues, teachers, principals would reach out to me and say, "Hey, how how do I get out of this?" right? How can I leave? How can I try something new? And this was pre-COVID, right? So you can imagine even during COVID and post-COVID, you know, I get text messages, calls, emails, probably once a month from people saying, how do I get out of education? I burned out. And, you know, I was very fortunate in real estate and I had connections. I knew the CEO of the nonprofit. So that wasn't a struggle to me. For me, the hardest part was going into the corporate or the business world. Um, and so I hired a career coach who later became my co-author, Naomi. 
And, um, you know, I hired a career coach. She helped with the resume. She helped kind of coach me up. Um, and I started turning people towards her. You know, they'd reach out to me. And I'd say, go talk to Nayeli. She's great. And after around the 12th person, I looked at Nayeli and I said, listen, this is a book idea, right? Clearly, yeah. people need this. And if you look around, there are programs. Uh, some people charge hundreds of dollars to take their boot camp or whatever to learn how to leave education. And I've heard some good things uh, about those programs, but they're hundreds of dollars, right? Yeah. Um, our book offers some pretty solid advice for less than 15 bucks. Um, yeah. It's a way to get started. Although, so, so it's a long answer. I'm sorry. I tend to ramble. I didn't start writing it until around five years after I left education. And, um, you know, it was mainly to kind of offer uh, help to yeah. educators. But I also saw it as an opportunity to highlight some of the things that are going wrong in education that and have been going wrong for decades and decades and decades. Yeah. And, um, and also to get my own personal story out there and ultimately offer some suggestions on how we might improve schools. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, like you said, it is very concise um, and to the point in terms of like just how in that change management process that that you've learned from for being a principal, but also having left education and looking at, yeah, like those those um, cogs in the wheel and all those types of things that could be improved upon, but like keep just getting worse from year to year. So we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. I did want to talk about um, so some of the stories. Um, you highlight different um, people um, in the book and talk about um, different paths that they've taken after they've left the classroom. A few of them um, went back into education um, after they'd left for a little while. Uh, a few of them did education adjacent jobs uh, or just did a career swap entirely. Uh, a few of them had been doing like a side gig, like I think you talked about a DJ. And so he went and started doing DJing full time. So for people who are wondering, um, maybe, you know, they're kind of teetering on, uh, do they want to stay next year? Cause we're recording this in April and, you know, or, you know, have they been maybe thinking about leaving education for a while? Uh, when is the best time to leave? And you also said there are categories. There's people who are ready to leave or people who are thinking about leaving, but not quite sure. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I would say there's no good answer. Um, yeah. Uh, there's two answers to there's two possible responses to when you should leave. And the one is when you have to leave, right. When you're so burned out, when your health is out, you know, one principal we interviewed, uh, she ended up in the hospital multiple times because yeah. she was, uh, you know, her job was affecting her physical health. Leave. No job is worth it. Um, yeah. uh, in fact, we cover this in the uh, afterward in the book that right after, or no, we were in the midst of, publishing this book and uh, a friend and colleague passed and he was in his late thirties, um, yeah. young guy, you know, two kids at home. He was feeling sick. He came home, took a nap on the couch, never woke up. Right. He was so stressed. And he had reached out to me the year prior saying, Hey Mike, how can I get out of this? And I gave my advice. I, uh, referred him to my company to put in a good word for him, but he actually got a promotion within the district and stayed. Um, so leave if, if your health, if your mental wealth, health being, well-being is being affected. The other answer is that leave when you get, get a job. And, yeah. you know, as we, you know, we say, you know, you, your first job out of education, you might take a pay cut. But the great thing yeah. is that unlike in education, I think people don't realize is that in education, especially public schools, you're kind of stuck in the same pay lane, yeah. pay grade. It's very straight trajectory. And people think, oh, my God. It's going to take me 10 years to get back up to that salary. No. Yeah. In fact, a couple of the people we interviewed, they took a pay cut, sometimes sizable the first year. Within six months a year, they're making as much, if not more, than they had. And you can, you can rise up much faster outside of you know, government jobs. Um, yeah. And the sky's the limit, right? The most you can make yeah. is a superintendent, which is a, you know, typically in smaller districts, six figures, you know, 150,000, 200,000. Larger districts, you can get you know, maybe three, four hundred thousand dollars. But yeah. in the business world, there's literally no limit. Um mm -hmm. and it's never too late to change. 
you know, the whole ageism thing is probably less so. Um, we interviewed someone who, who was like a couple of years from retiring and she mm -hmm. switched, started her own business and is doing well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's interesting for people who've been in education their whole career, like they, their eyes are really not open to that possibility. And like you say, like, Oh, well, I'm paid because I have this many years of experience of this degree. Well, you know, that's the thing. It's like talking to people. So, so when you talk um, about those people who switched careers or are highlighted in your book, um, how did they um, really embark upon these? Um, either it was a side gig for a while and then it turned into a full-time career. Um, what would you advise people who, who are thinking of leaving in terms of networking? And um, if all, especially if everybody they know or are connected to on social media are educators. Uh, that, that's the trick, right? And that's what we try to dispel. In fact, one of the guys uh, we interviewed, Jeremy, has written another book on how to use LinkedIn. Uh -huh. Because it's true, like you, you're in education and you only see other teachers. And, and strangely, it's a very isolating job because how often do you actually work with other teachers? You're usually working with children, right? Um, and so you have a very limited perspective, but everyone has connections, right? Your, your church, your local community, neighborhood organization, your neighbors, your friends. How I got the job now, I reached out, I had coffees with a bunch of people. And so the short answer is networking. That's it. Yeah. Not the resume. It's networking. Um, and you have a network via LinkedIn. Just cold call people. Find someone say, hey, your job looks, looks interesting. Can I learn more about it? And um, in my case, I reached out to an old friend and neighbor. Our kids go to the same school together. And I had coffee with him. I said, you know, you do change management. I Googled it. Uh, I think I've been doing change management my whole career. And, and he knows some of the things I've done. And he said, yeah, you have. You've done a great job doing it. And you've transformed organizations and, and we're hiring. And it was that mm -hmm. simple, right? He helped yeah. me with my resume, with the interview process. I got hired. That's, that's the gist of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. I had around five coffees. When I was leaving the nonprofit, I had around five coffees with people. And you know, I started with friends, people I knew people I trusted, and I had like three job offers or at least strong, very strong leads after these coffees. And that's another thing is um, in education, we don't think about just having a coffee with someone, right? Yeah. In the business world, that's what you do. You network because even if you're having a coffee with someone and you know they know they're not going to sell you whatever they're selling in business, but you never know. It might lead to something else. And business is all about networking. People love it. People like helping others. Um, and, you know, you're not burdening them. The worst that will happen is they'll say, no, I don't want to meet with you for coffee. That's it. Otherwise, meet with them, learn more about the job, get some tips, get some advice, ask who else you should meet with. You know, I'm on a lot of Facebook groups of, um, you know, teachers trying to leave the profession. There's a lot of them out there. And that people keep asking, you know, oh, uh, my resume. Yeah, your resume is key. But that's not yeah. what's going to make or break you. It's who you know. Yeah. Yeah. And and kind of speaking about the resume piece, uh, I think, like you said, that is a hurdle. People think that all they can put on the resume is their experience in education. But in your book, you highlight those transferable skills or even getting a low cost, a short time frame certificate like in project management. So yeah. What are some things that can easily transfer over if you're applying to the business world? Well, well, the first thing is to reword it because what I experienced personally, what I see over and over again, and everyone we interviewed for this book kind of verify the same thing. Most people do not know and appreciate what teachers and especially administrators do on a daily basis. Everyone has a stereotype in, in their head about what a teacher is or what a principal does. And everyone loves teachers. Everyone loves principles. Like, oh, you do that. You do great work. You change the world and blah, blah, blah. Um, but in their head, they think teachers read stories to children and they think principals, you know, suspend kids, right? That's a yeah. stereotype. They don't know mm -hmm. all the skills. And so you have to take all those skills, all your experiences and transfer them, uh, change the wording. So you, you don't have children, you have customers, right? Or the parents are stakeholders. Um mm -hmm. You, you don't write curriculum, you design programs. It, okay. it, it feels a bit inauthentic when you do that, but it's, it's what you do, right? You're, you have to 
frame your skills for the recruiter. They want to hire someone. They want to hire you. But they don't understand what you do for a job. So you have to use their language. Um, so that's the first and foremost. Um, and then certificates. You know, I have a ProSci, P-R-O-S-C-I, change management certificate. It took okay. one week to get. Cost five grand. Um, okay. But it wasn't a whole degree, right? I didn't have to go back and get an MBA. Um, and there's other certificates that are more affordable. You can take Coursera courses online and get a certificate. Those things matter. I was, I was kind of shocked. I thought in the business world, everyone would have an MBA. Now to get higher up, you typically do. Um, mm -hmm. But to get your foot in the door, a lot of people just have bachelor's degree degrees mm -hmm. and not necessarily in business. Anything and everything. You get your yeah. foot in the door through who you know, and then you work hard and you do the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think because educators are so used to having to be flexible and like managing the classroom and, you know, even if they haven't been like a, a administrator at a school, like um, it is easier to deal with adults, like when you're working with adults and uh, kind of transferring those skills of group management, right, to yeah. uh, working with a team or, you know, a lot of teachers do that teamwork already in PLCs and planning, but like you said, it's kind of rewarding. So um, I know you probably have uh, sites or you probably do resume review for some people as well. Where would you suggest people go if they need help with um, like rewording things to not sound so education jargony on the resume? Yeah, um, Jeremy uh, Schiffling, Schiffling uh, who we interviewed in the book, he has some AI tools. So I would recommend following him on LinkedIn. So for the very affordable route, you know, follow this guy, look up online. Um, there are tools that will help you that will automatically reword your resume for, for you. Um, right. You can do it on your own, but I was exhausted. I didn't know where to begin. I sure. hired someone. So Nayeli, I hired. The going rate, and it fluctuates, but typically it does cost around $500 to have someone rewrite your resume. But you really only have to do that once. And then once you have a new format and once you see how it's done, and it's not rocket science, but it helps, uh, you can rewrite it. You do have to rewrite your resume for almost every job you apply to to make sure you get those key words in there to get through, which typically, you know, some algorithm that is screening them out. Um, so it, it is an exhausting process, which goes back to networking can put you a step ahead by getting that referral. Um, but hire a coach or you know, use an online tool for it that everything's out there, but never pay more than, you know, $500, $750 for top notch at multiple resumes. Um, one guy tried to charge me, I, I'm not kidding at all. He wanted to charge me, I think around $10,000. And he was like, wow. this very slick salesman. He was like, I'll be with you the whole way and I'll help you get a six figure job and blah, 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 blah. And, and I was so desperate at the time. I talked to my wife and she looked at me like, you're insane, right? Like, it wouldn't be the first time I made a terrible decision. Um, fortunately, I didn't. But there's, there's people out there who will gladly take your money. Um, mm -hmm. Even though you're a kindergarten teacher for 30 years, they don't care. They're going to take your money. So be careful. Just know yeah. that it's 500 bucks for your typical coach. With Nayeli, I hired her, and we met once a week, and she was my coach. And what she did there is simply talk to me and help me understand what the business world was. Right. Mm -hmm. Just like people who have never been in education don't truly understand schools. They think they do because everyone says, oh, I, yeah. I've been I, I was a student. I know how schools work. Yeah. <laughs> and now you have no clue. Same thing. If you never <laughs> worked in the business world, you don't know. And so she helped me build up the confidence and say, Mike, you've done all these things. You are a principal. You led schools. You, you manage people. You can do this. It built that confidence and it's well worth the investment. So sometimes coaching does help uh, get you over the hump, right? Mm -hmm. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, in the book, uh, you also talk about uh, self-care. Uh, for example, um, your own experience uh, when you had the merger of the schools and like you thought that, you know, you would be getting more time when you uh, change positions to, uh, from being principal of one school to leading this merger, but no, uh, that was uh, not the case. So, um, you know, people put in 12 hour days, 12 to 14 hour days, a lot of the time um, as yeah. administrators. And like you said, some of them 
uh, have heart attacks, die early. Uh, so what are some things um, people do um, at, outside in the business world um, besides, um, you know, taking more time for themselves, but how can educators that want to stay in their profession do better? Yeah, what's interesting is that I did a lot of research for this book and around well-being for educators. And there are a couple yeah. of books out there around well-being for educators. And predominantly, the message is uh, self-care, meaning you have to take care of yourself. Um, and unfortunately, you do because, uh, you know, in my consulting business, we do actually sell service to help companies and schools if they're interested. And universities, we do a lot of this work with. Um, but I talked to all my friends, principals and superintendents across the country. What does your district do for well-being? And they'd rattle off a long list and I'd say, that's great. I know those programs. They're all SEL programs for the kids. What do you do for your teachers? And yeah. uh, nothing, right? Jeans day. Um, so yeah. you, unfortunately, you do have to demand. And first and foremost, turn off your laptop. Don't check your email on the weekends, in the evenings. Um, yeah. You deserve that time. Right, it's not healthy to constantly be checking. You know, there were teachers I worked with who, if I emailed them at ten o'clock at night, they would email back. I said, "What yeah. are you doing? Like, I'm emailing you because I, I was busy all day. I don't have time to get back to you. I don't expect a response till the next morning." And if you work for a principal or a superintendent who expects you to respond at ten at night, that's toxic. Go somewhere else. Um, don't stay there for the kids or whatever else guilt trip you give yourself. Take care of yourself first and foremost. And that was the thing that I realized in the business world. I, I was afraid. I was. I thought, oh, I'm not cut out for the business world, right? It's a doggy dog world. Some business, businesses are horrible. Some businesses are toxic, right? Uh, the one I work uh, for now is, is amazing, and there are plenty of others out there. In fact, I was shocked. You know, I, I consult, so I see it, the insides of lots of businesses now, right? How they work. And I was shocked at how much um how much how much leeway people have in the business world right in schools you know teachers do everything right and they literally buy school supplies for their own classroom that is insane you don't see people buying a stapler or computer or whatever for their for the business world people say like listen i'm not going to do it because that's not my job they don't have a union backing them up they just say this is my job description Right. If you want me to do more, go talk to HR, change my job description yeah. and give me a raise. Right. I mean, they don't say it outright, but that's how it is. Yeah. And it's kind of shocking. Right. And in the business world, in the corporate commercial business world, you can go to other companies, right? Within your town. In schools, you have one district in your town, right? You take it or leave it, right? There might be a Catholic school, there might be a charter school, but for the most part, you have limited choices. In the business yeah. world, that's not the same. You have a lot more choices. And so companies kind of honor well-being much more than schools. And so because of that, most companies, unless they're going through some massive change or unless you're high up and you're making six figures plus, they don't expect you to check your email after 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. or whatever. And so the well-being, the ability to achieve well-being is much easier in the corporate and commercial world, which is ironic. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about there's uh, a lot of money being put into corporations to retain educators, yeah. uh, you know, for example, uh, giving them like, I don't know, sending them away on trips, business trips that might not be like business related or PD related, right? It's more team building related, right? Or yeah. just having like a health uh, club membership, those types of things. Yeah. I mean, um, not so much traveling, but, but yeah, they, they, and you said retain educators, but you meant retain employees, I think. Um, retain employees in the business world, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, what's you think about, and you see this now in the news, the top businesses to work for. Um, there's a company, too. It's called um, Best Places to Work For. I forget what it's called now. We cover it in the book. Um, they rank the businesses, the best businesses to work for, right? We don't do that in the educational world. And so there's a lot of money because the thought, is pretty sensible in that, you know, I saw this in education, but we don't do anything about it. The cost yeah. to recruit, hire, train, and retain an employee is significant. Yeah. And so if it costs, you know, $10,000, $20,000, 
very likely more when you have someone leave and you don't have someone qualified to replace them. That instability can really harm businesses. And so they realize, you know what? It's better to invest a little bit, right? Maybe $1,000, $2,000 a year to keep our employees happy, right? If they're no good, we'll fire them. We'll get rid of them. But for the most part, why do we lose our best employees? And so they invest money in keeping you uh, to make you happy. In schools, we don't do any of that. No, all they do is uh, have people go to PD that often is not <laughs> really the that worst relevant. PD. The worst yeah, PD. Just yeah. sit there and listen to this <laughs> this over overpaid speaker for an hour. Yeah, or something that's a curriculum initiative in the district that you had no really, choice. Uh, yeah, no, no, and and that kind of leads into um, how the fact is like. A lot of us thought that the pandemic was this wake up call, that things were going to change. However, uh, for just me, for example, seeing that we're really just doing the same old, same old in schools, um, you know, what do you think is is really the cause of that? Like you talked to me that more families are homeschooling or doing hybrid learning because families are choosing to not necessarily send their kids to the neighborhood schools. But um, we talked a little bit about the parents, common core standards. Um, and that parent accept that schools are broken. Yeah, no, I, I blame it's 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 the you know, traditional story of it, it's a status quo, right? To change anything in society, it's uh, it's Sisyphus, right? You're constantly pushing a rock up the hill. And what we saw in the Common Core standards is one reason why it got tanked or didn't succeed as well as it should have is that yeah. you had parents posting things on social media saying, "What's this Common Core math? I, that's not how I learned." And so this yeah. notion that you know, parents complain if they don't understand how schools work. If they think it's not working, everyone's panicked now. One of my favorite books is um, "How to Raise an Adult," and it covers uh, the the way society has changed from when we were kids to now. And part of the big change are standardized test scores and the panic to get your kids into the best college and all the rest. And so every parent is panicked, and so if they don't have faith in their school they'll complain right away. There's no faith, there's no trust between parents and schools. And so if you try to change anything, parents are not gonna like it because they're afraid that their kids will be harmed and they oppose it every single time. And so, yeah, during the pandemic, it was a ripe opportunity. Um, And we lost it because fortunately we invest a lot in SEL and, you know, counselors and whatnot. And that was good. We finally recognized that, yeah, the well-being of kids yeah. we need to address. But within a few months after the end of COVID, whatever, um, it snapped back and people started talking about learning loss. Yeah, that's that's somewhat significant, right? However, you know, the, the thing is that if a whole generation loses a couple of years of learning loss, I, maybe I'm missing something, but it doesn't seem like that's a big loss because they're all yeah. on the same level, right? I, I don't know. Yeah. I, it was an excuse to go back to let's focus on, you know, the test score, right? And that was it. We threw everything out the window. Um, fortunately, I think with the advent of AI, I do think that's an, another opportunity. Um, you know, the folks I work with are developing a tool that it, it looks like magic, right? Um, it's about to go live shortly where you type in any topic, it develops a curriculum lesson plans, a video to teach the kid, assessments, everything within a matter of minutes. AI is going to revolutionize a lot of industries and it should revolutionize education. And Alpha School in Austin, Texas, I read about, is already using it. Um, It's the second opportunity to revolutionize schools um, from this factory model that's a century old to it should be project-based, very open-ended. And it's an opportunity that we can do if we have enough brave uh, public leaders who are willing to push forward with it. Yeah, and I think like, if we're just gonna keep the traditional factory model for another 20 years, there's gonna be more and more pushback, not only from parents, but from educators who are being tired of told, being told to like teach to this curriculum when Mm -hmm. teaching to the textbook is not engaging kids. Like this is what teachers know and have been seeing for, for a number of years. But 
yeah, that's a whole other conversation in itself with the AI model. And I know I have several people uh, coming up on the podcast and I've had several people on that talk about some of um, ed tech tools and different things that are, are coming up and coming. But um, you also in your book mentioned a little bit about um, how can we recruit people from other careers into education who are looking yeah. for a second career? Because um, we always do have people that either are long-term subs or that maybe are in their 40s or 50s that are new teachers. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is one reason why education is as it is, is because it's so isolated as an individual yeah. as a teacher, isolated, but then the, the education sector is very isolated to where you have to have this advanced degree. I mean, you need at least a bachelor's degree and then you get a certificate. People get master's degrees. They get wedded into this. They don't know how to yeah. leave. But then if you're if you if you spent 30 years in the business world, you've done well for yourself, you want to give back, how do you become a teacher? You don't want to go back and get another bachelor's degree, right? I often see people who go to education after a career somewhere else, but they go to charter schools or private schools and they do well. You know, a guy who was, in, uh, I think, a lawyer, he taught uh, my son for a year at our private school that we went to. Um, but we don't do that in public schools. And, and one person who reviewed my book um, well, I didn't list her as a reviewer. She said, I, I can't, I can't support your book because you're encouraging teachers to leave. And I was like, for their own good. But she, she, uh, pushed back and said, uh, bringing people from outside education, you know, opening the door, so to speak, um, will, will negatively affect the professionalism of the job. And I thought, well, that's interesting because, um, in the business world, they don't care, right? It, you can have a degree in basket weaving. If you can do the job, that's all they care about, right? That's all it comes down to. Can you do the job? I don't care what your degree is in. I don't care what your certificate you have. Can you teach? And uh, we need to open up those doors and make it. There are some programs. Um, Grow Your Own, which got started here in Chicago and it's gone nationally. They help um, train up very often in, in poor neighborhoods, very often with, um, with black and brown moms and dads. They help those folks become teachers. It's a wonderful yeah. program, but it's, I think it should be opened up. And I think uh, that's an alternative licensing program. Most states do have alternative license programs. I don't think they're widely known. I think they're still bureaucratic and take too long to get through. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we have to reconsider that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I see, um, you know, in Colorado as well, you know, there's a lot of people that can uh, do alternative licensure, but like, I think there are people that, at least I know in my own building, that are sometimes, you know, they're, they're a long-term sub. They don't want to take, if, if they're in their 50s and they're just doing this because, you know, they like working with kids, but they don't want to take all these programs and spend all this money getting the degrees and all that so they can be a certified teacher. They, they'd right. say, hey, you know, I'll take the money I get as a long-term sub and I'll just, then I have the choice to go where I want during the year too, they say, right. so... You, yeah. you know, cynically, I think one reason why this is happening is that teacher unions, and I'm in a blue state, right? They're the strongest union in the country. I'm yeah. friends with a lot of them. I support a lot of their reasons. Um, they don't want to open those doors. They, they're afraid it'll lower the professionalism. They think it's going to, you know, bring in folks who are not pro-union, all the rest. Um, yeah. So they oppose that. But I think cynically... Um, the folks who, who run some school districts will gladly um, take long-term subs, right? Costs a lot less money, right? Long-term subs tend not to get any pension or if they do a much smaller one. And so if all we end up with is a, is a temporary workforce, it's pretty good on your budget, right? So yeah. why, right? So, and that's the irony, right? So you have two opposing forces, which we see over and over again. And instead of kind of trying to, sit down at the table and work through it they just make the problem worse for both of them they both end up losing yeah yeah and that's i think what we're looking at in a lot of public schools right now it is they're not filling positions and they yeah. are like if they're lucky to get a long-term sub that's what they have and i know a yeah. uh, science position in my school like they've had one in the in the fall and then they had one in the spring and you know some some positions like they're on the third long-term sub of the year yeah. I mean, unfortunately. So, you know, it's been a great conversation around just um, 
people looking for um, options if they want to leave education, how they can uh, reword their resume, uh, getting a coach, and a little bit about your own story. Out of everything we've talked about today, what's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? Yeah, I think we said it in our in our pre-call too, which is uh, life is short, right? I've got uh, two kids. They're growing up quick. In the blink of an eye, they're, they're going to be growing up and out of the house. Um, life is short. You know, you enjoy life. And if, if going to work makes you miserable, whether you're in education or the business world, if you don't enjoy it, just leave. It's just a job. It's not who you are. You should, you don't have to enjoy your job. You don't have to love it, but you sure mm-hmm. as shit shouldn't be miserable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where can people connect with you and find you on? I think uh, my LinkedIn profile is in my book or I'm on LinkedIn. Happy to connect. Um, uh, and chat. I love talking to educators who want to change. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't coach or rewrite the resume. I might take a look. Uh, Nayeli does that, and she's. You can find her on LinkedIn. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, happy to chat. Social media. I'm on their way too often. Great, great. Well, I'll make sure to put that in the show notes. Well, thank you so much for being my guest thank on the Out of the Trenches podcast.